to everybody today. Well, you ought to sell your paper. Sometimes we say we feel good, and we just don't show it, do we? Got a few smiles out there. I can't see real good this morning. I don't know if my eyes and sight could be hurt. My ages could be either. Who had a good week this week? Absolutely lousy week this week. <laughs> we can't talk about that. Who had a so so week, but you're glad to be in church this morning? Good. Well, we are in Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. There's Jason. I normally have to have him to, to let me know where to mark my stand then. Morning, brother. How are you? Doing great. Not don't tell me. I don't want to know. Do we have any prayer requests this morning? Any, any praise? Brother Charlie?
have change affected in our lives today. God, as we come to this service, we pray that we would not be looking for just an ordinary service, but for a service that is speaking to us, speaking to those around us, those who gave themselves to us. We are so grateful that you're our God. We're so grateful that we can come to you and we come in love. We come boldly before your throne, knowing that you desire to give us work effectively in our lives. So, Father, do that this morning.
when they're children in it. It's the woman. And see, a woman has a choice. She can build up her house, or she can pluck it down to the ground. Maybe you know of some homes where a woman truly did build up a home. Gentlemen, isn't it a blessing to know that while you're gone, that the wife has to die? She's following the same principles at home that you're following. The children are being taught in the way that you would teach them. And the things are consistent. And the things your wife would want, or do you know of some situations where perhaps when the man leaves, she leaves? You may have seen that happen. Know of some homes where the wife had special deals with the children, but the husband knew nothing about it. The husband said the children aren't going here, but the wife said, I'm going to take them and do that. Or they can't do this, but the wife lets them do that and the husband doesn't. So ladies, you have such an incredibly valuable place in your home. A place of either building up that home or a place of plucking it down. And so it's so important to realize that in this, this country, in this country, we try to minimize that importance of that. Whether you work outside in the in the workplace or whether you are at home all the time. A woman's role in the home cannot be minimized. And the woman's primary role, and I say this unapologetically, if I offend anyone, I'm sorry, but the primary place for the woman to perform what she needs to perform is at home. I'm not against the woman working in the workplace, but the primary function of the woman is helping to build that house, helping to build that home. That's the primary function. Anything else should be secondary. In America, we, we think we have to have two incomes to make things work. But it's, it's not a wrong thing for a woman to work outside of the home, but it's a wrong thing for a woman not to have that proper place of income and that proper control. Those of us who, who have wives in the home are so grateful for them because of their ability to help build up our home. Verse 2 says, He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord, but he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. Those who would live right, those who would do right, those who want to make sure that their walk with God is consistent with what His, what his Word says, those are people who have a reverent, reverential awe for the Lord. And those who don't, He makes it very, very plain. Those who are perverse in their ways despise the Lord. They despise His instruction. Now, those are strong words, aren't they? We like to use terms like backsliding or I got away from what was important or got away from the basics. But when we do then we're showing a true attitude to the Lord that's not great. We're showing that, that basically we despise the Lord and we're going to follow His way. And so it's important that we walk uprightly and fear the Lord. It's important. I was talking to someone yesterday who told me, you know, I was doing something wrong, and I knew right then that God was watching. And we need to remember that. We need to remember as we live this life, that we're to walk in our righteousness and we're to fear the Lord. We need to have a reverential fear. We need to be ever mindful of what God thinks about what we're doing with everything we do. And hopefully our attitude is to walk in uprightness, to walk in a way that pleases Him. But we need to recognize when we don't, that's perversion. That's going against what God said. And He just calls it like it is. If we do that, then we're showing that we despise Him. Verse 3, in the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. What do you think that means? In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. You ever think about why the foolish are foolish? Is being foolish a choice? Can we choose to be foolish? So it's not a brain thing. It doesn't mean that I don't have enough intelligence. Being foolish has nothing to do with intelligence, does it? So when we act foolishly, do we choose to act foolishly? How many believe that? Do you believe that a fool is a fool because he chooses to be a fool? Absolutely. And so if a fool chooses, he's got that rod of pride. You see, a foolish person is choosing their way instead of God's way. A foolish person says, I'm not going to take this. I'm not going to take this advice. I'm not going to take this way of life. I'm not going to live this way. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to choose, actively choose to participate in foolishness. 
So many people think that foolishness is something that just happens to us. No, it's not. It's a choice. It's a choice, and it's a choice of pride because we, we exalt our own way of thinking rather than God's way of thinking. So in the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. It's a pride issue. But the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Why do the lips of the wise preserve them? Because they've chosen wisdom. They've chosen God's way. They've chosen the way that fits in the way God designed this earth to operate. We've said it before. God set the rules for this earth. When he created this earth, he, he explained to us in the Word of God how we ought to live, how we ought to be, how we ought to behave ourselves, what manner of thinking we ought to have. And so when we do that, when we are wise based on his wisdom, then we're going to be preserved. We're going to have a better life. We're going to have less less issues to come up because we're doing it God's way. I love verse number four. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. What can we learn from that? You think? You think? So the, the example is that if we don't have an ox, we don't have much going on. It's easy to keep things clean and neat and straight and all of that, right? Now, does everybody want the crib clean? Sure we do. Most people want things nice and neat and straight. But you know, if there's nothing going on, it's pretty easy to keep things clean and straight, isn't it? But nothing is getting done. Oh, we put here on this earth to do nothing. No, we're not. We're put here to do something specific. God has something in mind. God has a plan for every one of our lives. And we need to get out and get about it. And you know, sometimes we do have to get a little dirty when we work. We've got to get out and we've got to to make a mess, so to speak. While we're busy, while we're busy for God. Are we going to have every aspect of our lives all nice, nice and neat and tidied up while we're doing that? No, sometimes you get out in the thick of it and it's kind of hectic. Ladies, I think especially of you raising children. I remember one time when Jonathan was born, our our crib was definitely not clean. We had, uh, Jennifer was was keeping him and she primarily worked at home. And I had some asset that the company had that I had to keep stored at my house for safety. And one of my bosses came by and he wanted to see it. So we'd go by the house. And I walked in, and I honestly thought somebody had broken in. I don't care if they had Jennifer and tell them that we store it. Hopefully she won't watch the, the video after. But I don't know. Jonathan was maybe two, and I think she had to go out for a quick doctor's appointment. She had forgotten or something. So she just picked him up, and out the door she went, and right behind her, I come in, and I open the door. And there is a load of clothes that had spread from one end of the house to the next. I mean, I'm literally walking two steps and picking up a towel and a shirt, and it, it, it was just, oh, it was terrible. I was so glad she wasn't there when that happened. But uh, I, I just looked at my boss and said, I'm not really quite sure what happened here, but let me go find what you need to see. <coughs> so I'm sure he was not real impressed at that point, but that's okay. But, you know, sometimes when we're out and we're busy, things are going to get a little messy. Isn't that where the increase comes from? If we're sitting only doing just what we know we can do, then we're not getting much done. Have you ever had God to stretch you? How many of you have ever had God tell you to do something you were absolutely, positively sure you couldn't do? And then God showed you you could. He stretched you beyond what you thought. Maybe it got a little messy in the process. But we ought to be that way. We ought to be ready to be challenged by God to do whatever it is because we're really doing work. He is. We're just privileged to be blessed to be a part of it. And so we need to remember that sometimes that crib is going to get a little messy, but there's going to be much increase by the strength of God. When we get busy, when we go out, when we work, when we take a stand, when we do some things that we're doing just because God says, that's what I think about doing. And then we need to realize that's going to be an increase that comes by the strength of the ox. Verse 5 says, A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. What kind of witness is Jesus? What kind of witness is Jesus? Can you always be counted on to be a faithful witness? Can you 
always be counted on to be one that's depended on. A faithful witness will not lie. But Paul says that that is wrong. And what kind of witnesses do you want to hang around? Do you want to hang around a false witness or do you want to hang around a faithful witness? You know, we already know which is which, don't we? Who do we spend our time with? Who do we become like? You know, when we spend time around people, we become like them, right? And so we ought to surround ourselves by people who are going to be faithful witnesses, people who we know are not going to lie, people who are true about what they are and who they are and what they believe, people that are going to sharpen us and not sharpen us. So we need to make sure that we're the right kind of witness and not be a false witness. Verse 6 says, A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. What's a scorner? I don't know. What's a scorner? What does it mean to scorn? How about a scoffer? We know what a scoffer is. What's a scoffer? One who complains about everything, surely not. So a scoffer or a scorner. Now let's see what it says about that scoffer or scorner. That scoffer seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. Now how can that be? Why is it that a scoffer or scorner can't find wisdom? My Bible says wisdom is pretty easy to get. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. He's not looking for it, is he? He's looking for wisdom, but what kind of wisdom is he looking for? He's looking for wisdom that matches his way of thinking. Now, we do that sometimes, don't we? Do you ever have an opinion about something, and you go to somebody else that you know will have the exact same opinion so you can get some agreement? Anybody else do that? I know I'm probably the only one. But a scoffer seeks wisdom. But what he's really seeking is approval for his own way of thinking. His stinking thinking. He wants to find somebody else that will have that same stinking thinking. But he can't find wisdom because there's not wisdom in it. There's not wisdom in being a scorner. There's not wisdom in being against those things. And so he can't find it because he really doesn't want to. When he finds true wisdom, he turns it aside because it doesn't match his way of thinking. So how do we apply that? Hey, if we're looking for something in the Word of God, but we don't find support for what we're thinking, maybe our thinking is wrong. Maybe we've gotten to be a little bit of a scoffer or a scorner. Have you ever found yourself to be contrary to what a lot of people in the church are doing? Has that ever happened to you? I know I'm the only one. You know, somebody expresses an idea, and I just think, I don't like that. But everybody else seems so excited about it. How can it be that all those people are wrong? Maybe it's me. Maybe I've got a scoffer's part in this thing. So I need to examine and make sure that that's not what I am. Make sure I seek godly wisdom. Because the last part of that verse says, Knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. So James is right. If any of us lack wisdom, we really can ask of God. And he gives liberally. In other words, more than we need. So we can obtain wisdom as long as that's what we're really wanting. Don't dare pray and ask God to give you wisdom if you don't want it. So many times we ask God for approval. That's what we really want. Well, give me approval for what I want to see here because I'm having trouble with it. Maybe you're having trouble with it because he's not approving it. And so wisdom is so easy to get if we just ask for it and if we're looking for a good godly understanding. Verse 7, Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. What's that? Don't hang around with him. Why? You will become like him. We ought to instruct our children. We ought to instruct anyone that we have influence on. If someone is acting like a fool, if they're acting foolish, if they're, their way of life doesn't match up with our way of life, short of witnessing to them to see them come to Jesus Christ, we don't need to be around them. Do you find yourself becoming like those you hang around? You do. Husbands and wives, do you find yourself more like your spouse every day? Jennifer and I 
have almost completely switched roles as a servant to him. And I've become a lot more like her. She's become a lot more like me. I don't know which one got the worst deal. I think she did. But, but we become like those we serve. And so if we're around someone who is not about the things we ought to be about, we ought to go to them just as soon as we possibly can. And we ought to instruct our children in that. We ought to instruct anybody that we have influence with. Why? Because that person is going to have an influence on us. I know I've told this at least once before. Remember I told you I, I had one week I spent with a guy that did the very same thing I did in my job. And I had a wonderful, wonderful job. They paid me way more than I was worth. And I was happy about that. I had a wonderful job. I could set all my hours, company car, expense accounts, everything. And so I'm riding one week with this guy who does the very same thing. And he got in my car Monday morning. I was just as happy as I could be. Had a wonderful job, wonderful life. And the more I sat with him all week long, by the time I got out of the car Friday night, I was ready to quit. I was so unhappy about my job, I'd never thought about those 42 things he told me that were wrong about our job. And I was miserable. And I got home and was talking to Jennifer. I said, I just never realized how bad I had it. And I got to thinking about that thing, and I thought, in one week's time, that man took me from being totally happy to being very miserable. Thank goodness I woke up before Monday morning. But that's the way it is. When we hang around people that are at heart to us, and we're going to fail. And so there's some good advice that Solomon gives us there to go from the presence of the foolish man. Verse 8 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is to see. You see, a, a prudent man wants to understand why he's doing what he's doing, how he can do a better job of it, why what he's doing is the right thing, what about what he's doing is the wrong thing that he can change, how it lines up with the Word of God. That prudent man is looking to constantly improve his way. What am I doing now that I shouldn't be doing? What can I do better? But a foolish man sees himself. And his folly becomes his reality. And he's not looking to change a thing about it. In fact, he's just looking to justify it. You ever heard anybody that would sit there and just justify their lifestyle? Well, I know this is wrong, but I do this because of this. And what they do is they just see this. We do it ourselves, don't we? The Bible says the heart is deceitful. Who do we deceive? Ourselves. That's it. And so that person, the folly of fools is to see a fool takes delight in fooling himself and making himself think anything that they say. That's the difference in a prudent man and a fool. Verse 9 says fools. <coughs> <coughs> fools make a mock of shame. We really need to take that to heart, don't we? <clears throat> How many times do we mock shame? How many times do we hear about shame taking up the entire time? Some comment that maybe degrading the sin and making shame of that. That's not a healthy attitude, is it? The Bible says that someone who does that is a fool. Fools make a mock of sin. Fools don't accept sin as sin is. Fools will make light of sin. Is it any wonder if our children hear us make light of sin all the time? We've all done it at some point in time. I remember growing up, you know, the thing we made the most fun of when I was growing up was women's speech. Homosexuality. Back in my father's day, they took them out back and dealt with it. In our day, we laugh at it, and now 
not enough to be joyful. We all know the things that we go through. We all know the things that create bitterness in our life. We all know the things that will rob our joy. And sometimes we keep those things to ourselves. What, it, what that verse is saying there, that the strangers don't share that, which is joy. The bitterness is the joy. And we even most of the time in an unsaved world, even the joy is taken with us when we fall. A couple of verses later, I think we'll cover that. The heart knoweth his own business. The stranger did not intermeddle with there with his joy. Verse 11, the house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Do we believe that? Do we believe that the house of the wicked shall be overthrown? Do we believe that the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish? Sometimes it's hard to see that in this world, isn't it? Does it frustrate you like it frustrates me when we see someone who's openly wicked and they appear to be flourishing? It's frustrating, isn't it? So many times we look and we think, why is that person seemingly blessed? They're not Christian. You know, that's only one snapshot of time. And as we look at the entire picture, see something entirely different. The fact now that the wicked is going to be overthrown. It is going to be a result from which it's going to be judgment that extends down generations when we are with the Lord. And then the second part of that verse tells us that the, the tabernacle of the dwelling tent of the upright shall flourish. Keep doing right. Keep living right. Keep directing your family right. Don't get discouraged because that's a principle from God. The tabernacle of the upright. When we're trying to do right, when we're trying to honor God in our home, when we're trying to do the right thing, when we're frustrated that we're saying, God, I am trying as best I know how to honor you with my home, to honor you with my life, to honor you in the way that I live. Frustration shall come as the tent of the upright shall flourish. God is going to bless your efforts. You may not feel blessed right now. You may be in the middle of something. It may be so frustrating. But when we do right, God will watch us. The eyes of the Lord are on us. Isn't it? Doesn't God see? And doesn't God know what we're doing? And doesn't God know our frustration? And didn't God inspire the words that were written here? And so this is not just something we hope happens. This is a principle. The tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Keep on keeping on. Keep doing right. God is going to bless you. Right. Verse 12 says, There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What do you think of that? There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. try to convince God that we're being okay? You ever made a deal with God because you knew you just weren't quite right but you were kind of trying to find some compromise there somewhere? Anybody ever done that? Am I the only one? Boy, I've got so many things you folks can learn from. I've got it all wrong and if you can just learn everything I got wrong, you're going to be great. Have I told you about the time that I gave up gambling, sort of? Sort of. I used to love to gamble. Love to gamble. I never gambled any way, anything away that was going to put my family in jeopardy. I was not addicted to gambling or anything. It was just something I thoroughly enjoyed doing. But God had convicted me about gambling, uh, more so about the testimony of it. I mean, it's a little bit difficult to sit at a casino and you're at a blackjack table and you're trying to hand a track to the guy next to you. It's just a little difficult to do. So God had convicted me for years about gambling, but I had a chance to go on a trip, and I knew there was going to be gambling there. I said, Lord, i got a deal for you. And I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but it, it went a lot like that. I said, God, I just want to gamble $250. I've got it over here. It's set aside. It's not messing with my finances at all in the home. I just want to have fun and gamble $250. And Lord, to show you that my heart is pure, I'm going to go ahead and give the 
church we've understood to that. I'm going to write that check and put that in before we go. And so I did. I said, furthermore, Lord, if you choose to bless my winnings, I'm going to give all of those to the church too because I just want to see some gems. And so I did. I wrote the check for 250 I carried 350 At the appointed time, I went and started gambling. And best I can recall, I was winning. It doesn't take long to go through $250 in a casino, but I was winning. And you know, I'm sitting there having what I thought was a good time with God's blessing I had convinced myself. And then I looked over to the right. And sitting there in kind of a lounge area just where people could sit and relax and maybe get a, a soft drink or something like that, I saw three of my employees who were watching. I didn't even have to tell him. He said, you get it, man? I did get it. And I got up, and I haven't been back since, and I did keep my word. I gave whatever it was that went that day, but I gave it right then, because that was a deal I had made with God and I made with God alone. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. It's not just those who are wicked who that those who are unsaved, we as Christians can get off track too. That we can. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. In the end of that mirth is heaviness. You know, the more we think about this world and this world system and the way that things are in the world, there's no secret of the heart that can be trusted. You know, there is nothing about this world that promises anything that we can count on. Anything that would give us joy. Anything that would give us true peace, true happiness. Everything in this world is sorrowful apart from Him. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and the good man shall be satisfied from himself, or literally from the love of himself. The backslider in heart is filled with his own ways. He's convinced he, himself that the way that he should be doing it is okay. Things are working out all right. The backslider convinces himself, fools himself, deceives himself. He's filled with his own way. He's convinced himself that it's all right. It must not be too bad because God hasn't judged me yet. So, backslider in heart will tell himself anything to make things seem right. The good man shall be satisfied literally from above and itself. He's looking for his satisfaction from God. He's looking for his satisfaction in the fact that he's pleasing to Verse 15, the simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. The simple believeth every word. Do we believe everything we're told today? When you read something on the Internet, it must be true. It's on the Internet, right? <laughs> we laugh now, but it wasn't so funny 10 years ago. Everybody thought everything you read there must be right. Some people still believe that. It's in print. It must be right. They wouldn't let them put it on the Internet. But, you know, we need to be more than the simple. We need to look at the things that we're told and that we're taught. You know, we ought to even check up on our Sunday school teacher. We ought to check up on our pastors and make sure that, and I'm not saying our pastor is, is, needs to be checked on, but we ought to make sure that what we're taught in church matches what the Word of God says right. And I don't think you're going to find, I haven't heard a single thing our pastor said that went against the Word of God, and I don't think we will, but we ought to look. You hear something you've never heard before, you ought to check it out and make sure it's true. And we ought, as Christians, we just ought not to be doubtful. We ought to seek and look out and make sure things are right. Because the simple will take everybody's joy. But a prudent man looketh well to his door, and a prudent man can literally considers carefully what he's told. If he's told something, he just doesn't accept it to be. Be careful. An old saying, trust, but verify. You know, when my children would tell me something, where have you been, what have you done? I trust them, but I also verify. Because a prudent man looks well to his soul. A prudent man just doesn't take, you know, something that doesn't sound right to be true. Verse 16, last verse we'll cover today. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. Wise man feareth. Who does he fear? He fears God. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil. 
those who are wise, when they're faced with evil, when they're faced with a bad decision, when they're faced with the possibility of being wrong, they stop and evaluate based on who their lawyer is. What is my God going to think about what I'm trying to do? What is my God going to think of me? What is my God going to do? Am I going to disappoint him? I've got a head bunch of fear tonight. I've got some things I'm going to say. It's not that I fear that he's going to just reach back and just smack me in the lap. relationship. And when you grew up as a child and you just couldn't that just broke your heart. And I remember and I did a lot of disappointing with my child. You know what? I don't remember a single time I was disappointed. I remember the positive. I remember looking into my dad's eyes and I was disappointed. knowing that we have to take up and respond to that God in no spirit. We love Him back. But we do it on no spirit. The wise man heareth and departeth to do the right thing. Please stop. But the fool rageth and is confident. Have you ever seen a fool who knew they were making the wrong decision? They knew they were doing the wrong thing. They knew it was not going to end well. And the longer they talked about it, the more confident they got in that decision. If you want some entertainment, see about this. You ought to see some of the videos that are on YouTube of foolish things that people do because they talk themselves into this is a good idea. Shame on you. The fool is going to just rant about it. He's going to have rage. He's going to be confident in the wrong thing. Why? reverential fear of God combined with the Holy Spirit working in our heart is what keeps us on track anyway. We have the Holy Spirit of God to help us in our lives. Those who aren't saved have no more of a conscience than that. Their conscience is good enough to do it. But we'll stop there on verse 16. Start back, uh, Lord willing, next week on verse 17. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. Lord, just the simple practicality of the Word of God is such a blessing. We thank you that you give us the rules to live in this world. We thank you that you set it up, and if we'll follow your rules, we'll have a wonderful life. We just thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you to love us enough to give us the rule book. You give us the Holy Spirit of God to direct us in the right way and to caution us. 
forward to that day that I stand just over in the glory land. How about you? Well, I guess three of us are. I hope to see the rest of you there as well someday, where we will stand with that mighty host, not because we are mighty in and of ourselves, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us when he shed his blood on the cross. I'm thankful he did that, that he paid the price I could not pay to give me the opportunity to stand just over there someday. And I am indeed looking forward to that day. Welcome to our service here at Cornerstone Independent Baptist Church here the first Sunday in the month of June. It's hard to believe that we're to this point in the year already, but the Lord has brought us to the midpoint of the year, and I'm looking forward to all that's coming up here in the very near future. One of the things that happens, of course, many times around this time of the year is that uh, school starts to get out. And this morning, as a part of our service, we're going to be recognizing two of our recent college graduates who have uh, gone through their time at college and graduated and moving on to what the Lord has for them. So I'm going to invite Brother Ronnie Peacock to come at this time, and he's going to recognize these two graduates this morning. I can have uh, Philip Fisher and Peyton Peacock come forward. They'll come from behind me, so watch your forward. These young, two young people have just recently graduated from college, and uh, it's good to see them already serving in the music ministry here as they're back. Uh, Philip Fisher just graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Youth Ministry from Pensacola Christian College, and his future plans are to, first of all, get married, and then seek the Lord's uh, direction uh, concerning future opportunities, considering possibly going back for a master's, but it seems he wants to continue studying. graduate recognition when you finally get through with books. You think you're through with books, and then what do we give you? We give you a book for grace. No. So this is a different kind of book. This will be a good one to, uh, to as they study and read and go forward in their lives. Then uh, Caitlin Peacock just graduated with a Bachelor in Journalism and Mass Communication from Bob Jones University. Her future plans are to work in videography or marketing, whatever the Lord leads. Father, we thank you.
ask our ushers to come forward as we receive our tithes and offerings and worship the Lord in that way. I'll ask Brother Donnie Russ if you would pray over our offering.
much to Jesus. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Let's stand as we sing number 114.
open your Bibles with me this morning to the 8th chapter of John's Gospel, John chapter number 8. I want to add my word of appreciation and just um, congratulations to our recent graduates. It was a while ago now, but I do actually remember graduating from college, and um, it is quite an undertaking, it is quite a, an accomplishment, and so we are very thankful to the Lord for bringing these through their years of college, and for placing them right back here, at least for the time being, and they, both Caitlin and Philip, have gotten involved in service, and we're so thankful for that. You're in John chapter number 8. Recently, Stephanie and I have picked up on uh, a fact that Brooklyn has picked up one of our bad habits. We both have the tendency to pick at our fingernails and, you know, that kind of a bad habit. And it was one I remember from time to time my parents tried to break me up. I think there was one time I was sitting in front of my mom in church picking my nails, and I think she smacked me in the back of the head to try to get my attention and get me to stop right in church. But um, we found that Brooklyn is doing this now. We'll, we'll look, and she'll have her fingers in her mouth. She'll even have her foot up and in her mouth just messing with her fingernails, even her toenails. And so... Stephanie and I have decided that we need to help Brooklyn by helping one another try to break this habit. And so from time to time, I might see Stephanie or she might see me, and, and we might have to remind each other that we're trying not to pick at our nails anymore. So a few nights ago, um, we happened to be in our bedroom, and my wife was picking at her nails. And I reached over, and I just smacked her hand, gave her a nice little love tap to, Reminder not to pick her nails. And she responded, and it was in part because we'd been talking about this text and the message that we're going to look at this morning. She responded and said, Mike, you are holding me to a higher standard than you're holding yourself to. Look at your nails. They look worse than mine right now. And she was right. They do indeed look worse than hers do at the time being. But isn't that something that we all do from time to time? Isn't it true that from time to time we hold other people to a higher standard than we hold ourselves to? In John chapter 8, we're going to see this action going on in this text. And it is, it, it is a behavior that God has for us to examine today in relation to our church and our individual lives. We're going to be reading in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Would you notice what the Bible says? Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Would you bow your heads as we pray? Heavenly Father, help us today as we study the Word of God uh, here in the Gospel of John, a, a historical event that happened in the ministry of Jesus that belongs in our Bible. Lord, an event that we can and should learn from. And I pray today that as we examine the Word of God, 
that you would speak to each of our hearts, that you would help each one of us to have open ears and minds and hearts to what you have for us. May the Holy Spirit of God do his work through the word in each of our lives today. And we'll be sure to praise and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to John chapter 8, it's been a few weeks, but please understand that the event that's presented to us here in this chapter takes place during the week of the Feast of Tabernacles that we saw Jesus come to in John chapter 7. On this particular day, as the Bible tells us, he comes early into the mor- in the morning to the temple where he was surrounded by a large crowd of people, and he sat down, as was the culture of the day, and began to teach the people. Into this scene, the Bible tells us, steps some of the scribes and Pharisees. These religious leaders came, and the stage was set for another showdown between the religious leaders and Jesus. As we read in the text, you have to understand, Jesus is there in the temple. The people are surrounding Him. They have circled Him. Jesus sits down in the midst. But as these religious leaders come in, you can imagine they make their way through the crowd and they now form the inner circle around Jesus and they thrust this woman toward Jesus, at which time likely Jesus now stands. And the Bible tells us that they say to Jesus, Master, here is this woman, a woman guilty of adultery. She has been apprehended in the very act. We might say she was caught red-handed, or she was caught with her hand in the cookie jar. Uh, Phrases that maybe we're more familiar with. These men are indicting this woman for this, this crime, this sin, the breaking of the law, the adultery, having been witnessed in the very act of her sin. They continue, Master, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. You go back and you study in the law, you could go to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse number 10, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 22 through 24, and you would find that in reality, the law did demand that an adulterer or an adulteress would be condemned to death. They presented this lawbreaker. They presented their case. They presented the law. Now they have a question. But what sayest thou? Jesus hears the criminal. Hears the the law. Here is our case against her. This isn't hearsay. This isn't just the local gossip. This woman was caught in the very act. Now what do you have to say? John, who is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, shows us the motive of these men in verse number 6 as he tells us that this they said tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. They sought to ensnare Jesus by laying a trap for him, much the way that you might lay a trap for some creature that you're hunting. My wife and I discovered recently we have a mouse in the house. Last Saturday night, we were sitting with the company that we had staying with us for a couple of days, and all of a sudden, my wife started getting very worked up, and she pointed and didn't say anything. It was more just like, ah! Ah! I literally thought someone was breaking into the house and that I was going to have to deal with it, or at least have her deal with it or something. But no, I looked, and over against the wall, here was, I'm assuming, just a little field mouse running to and fro. So I did the what I thought was the smart thing. I went out and got some of the sticky traps. I've heard that the traps that might kill them, they may get out of and get away and die somewhere else, and then you've got that putrid smell. Well, I've been checking my sticky traps each day, and sure enough, I found one of my sticky traps displaced. It wasn't where I had put it, and there was a bunch of fur stuck to it, but the mouse was nowhere to be found. 
I saw it again at about 5 o'clock this morning. I laid traps. The traps did not work too well. They laid a trap for Jesus. In fact, this had become their habit. They've attempted many times already to ensnare Jesus in his words. They're trying to do so again, and it won't work. It's been said, if anyone tries to embarrass Jesus, they still find themselves instead put to shame. And that's exactly what will be true in this case. How was this a trap, though? It seems as if they're just asking an opinion, but there is more going on here than that. They're coming to Jesus acting as if he is the judge of the case. They've presented the law. They've presented their case. They've presented the one guilty of crime. And they are asking him to pass judgment, but they are doing so subtly, setting a trap for him. You see, if Jesus responded with mercy for the guilty, they might accuse Jesus in the very least of being a disregarder of Moses' law. This one who taught and proclaimed doctrine and teaching to the people, they may now turn and say, hey, don't listen to him. He doesn't even regard the law of Moses, which of course was held in great esteem. If Jesus, on the other hand, responded with condemnation for the guilty, they could then accuse him of, to the Roman authority, of setting himself over them because they had at that time taken away the ability or authority of the Jews to execute any man for any reason. Even for religious reasons, the Jews had no authority without the Roman approval to execute anyone. So, in their mind, this is a perfect trap. In their mind, they have got Jesus right where they want Him. There is no getting out of this trap for Him. But Jesus the personification of perfect wisdom. Stoop down. The Bible says, as if he heard them not. Do you like it when you ask somebody a question and they seem to just ignore you and move on? Or better yet, it's not even that they just move on in the conversation. They don't say anything at all. Jesus stoops down. He begins to write on the ground. You, like me, have probably heard or maybe done some reading about what Jesus wrote on the ground. Everything is just conjecture. It's just opinion. And as my grandpa said, I believe I've shared with you before, opinions are like armpits. Everyone has them normally. They stink. I don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground. I'm not going to begin to guess. In my opinion, if it were important, God would have let us know. He doesn't tell us what he wrote. He simply stooped down, and with his finger, he began to write there on the ground. The men, the Bible says, they persisted in their asking of him, though, to come to a decision, to respond to their question, to their request. The Bible says, verse 7, they continued asking him. You can imagine, like your young child, when they ask you a question and want an answer at this moment. Jesus, we've asked you a question. Master, aren't you going to respond to us? Master, what is to be done with this woman? What do you say? We presented our case. We presented the law. We presented the the criminal. What do you have to say? The Bible doesn't tell us how long passes, but after a time, Jesus raised himself and gave his response, which we read in verse number 7. He that is without sin among you. Let him first cast the stone at her or cast the first stone at her. Upon saying this, Jesus simply went back to the ground, stooped back down and began writing with his finger again in the dust there on the ground. What did Jesus say? What did he mean by this? They knew exactly what he meant. Without sin, that phrase that Jesus uses here means sinless. It denotes either one who has not sinned or one who is incapable of sinning. Now, I want you to understand what Jesus did not infer here. 
Jesus did not infer that a judge must be seamlessly perfect to pass judgment on a case. If that were true, then no man could pass judgment on a case. That's not what Jesus meant here. What Jesus said to them was directly related to this situation. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? One of two things is possible. Either Jesus meant to prick their own hearts about the seventh commandment. That is, they brought to Jesus one who was guilty of breaking the seventh commandment. What is that? Thou shalt not commit adultery. And by making this statement, it's just possible that what Jesus meant was the one who himself is not guilty of breaking this seventh commandment can cast the first stone. You say, is that really a possibility? Well, the Jews were very backslidden in Jesus' day. There was quite a disregard, in fact, for the law among many of the people of Israel. However, I I would doubt seriously that each of the men in this case had been guilty of breaking the seventh commandment by the physical act. The likelihood of what Jesus meant was this. If you are sinless in this situation, if you yourself are not guilty of law-breaking in this current event, then you can cast the first stone. Had they, in reality, these who portrayed themselves as zealous for the law, had they, in reality, followed it? The answer is no. You say, Pastor, how can you say that? Had they followed the law, they would have brought the offending man along with the offending woman to be held in judgment. They had not followed the law. Had they followed the law, they would have taken the offenders to the God-ordained judge of of such situations, which was the high priest. Had they done that? The answer is no. Jesus was not the one who was set up to sit in judgment on this case. They would not followed the law. Had they followed the law, their motivation, as Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 22 says, would have been to put away sin or folly from Israel rather than adding to the sin by seeking for an opportunity to kill Jesus. Had they followed the law? The answer is no. So Jesus essentially says this, The one among you who is pure in this, let him deal with this woman as the law demands. Jesus stooped back down and he began writing again with his finger on the ground. I don't know how long passed, But the Bible says they which heard it, particularly, specifically speaking of this group of men, these scribes, these Pharisees who had brought the woman to Jesus and demanded that he pass judgment. The Bible says that when they heard it, they were convicted by their own conscience. The thought here is literally they fell under conviction. And one by one, beginning with the eldest, and going down to the last or the youngest, they simply removed themselves from the situation. The Bible says when Jesus looked up, he saw no man. That is, he didn't see any of the accusers. The crowd is still there. But Jesus focused on the woman and had that conversation we see that he had with her here. The truth of this text is this. These men experienced the phenomenon that a true encounter with the Word of God will produce. And that is a conscience conviction. Romans chapter 2 and verse 15 says, "...which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another." 
these men had a true encounter with the personified Word of God, Jesus Christ Himself. And that encounter brought what any true encounter with the Word will bring, and that is a conviction from God. A conviction even within the very God-given conscience that every man has. One writer said this, The power of the conscience stands out here in a very striking manner. Fallen and corrupt as man is, we must never forget that God has left him with a certain sense of right and wrong called conscience. It has no power to save, convert, or lead to Christ, but it has the power to accuse and prick and witness. And that's exactly what happened here. These men were accused, they were pricked, their conscience witnessed against them in this situation. The imperfect creature was confronted by the perfect Creator, and He could not stand in His presence. Jesus cast light on an action of these men that is common throughout humanity. And that is that action of holding others to a higher standard than we hold for ourselves. When Jesus said in verse number 7, He that is without sin among you, He identified a sin that was common to each of them. The sin of hypocrisy. For the remainder of our time, I want us to have an encounter, a true encounter with the Word of God. And as we do, as it did for these men, the Word will produce a conscious conviction in each of us who struggle with this sin of hypocrisy. And my challenge to you this morning is to come to the Word with an open heart, to say to the Lord, as David did in Psalm 26, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try the reins of my heart. Because by its very nature... Hypocrisy is difficult to identify in ourselves. But if we will come truly and say, God, examine me, God will shine the light as Jesus did for these men in John chapter number 8. Would you see in the text with me this morning the attitude of hypocrisy? The attitude of hypocrisy. Every, every action has a root cause. Everything that you do, everything that I do, has a cause that is at the root of it. Hypocrisy has a root cause that is rooted in the very heart of man's fallen nature. And that root is pride. Hypocrisy springs from man's pride. Hold your place in John chapter 8. Let me show you where Jesus addresses this in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. In this passage, this entire chapter, Jesus deals with this sin, with this situation. He deals with the same group that he dealt with in John chapter 8, the scribes and the Pharisees, these religious leaders. In this chapter, Matthew 23, he pronounces eight woes upon them for hypocrisy. But before he pronounces the woes, in verses 5 through 12, Jesus demonstrated the attitude that led to the action of hypocrisy. What was that attitude? Look at Matthew 23, verse 5. He's been speaking of the scribes and Pharisees, but in verse 5 he says, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Everything that these religious leaders did, Jesus said, all of their ascribed spirituality was simply to make a show of men. They desired to show or display their spirituality, but more than that, they wanted to be admired for their spirituality. In verse number 6, Jesus said of them, they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. He, he says of these men, it was their desire. It, it was in their nature. It was their 
their purpose and their goal, even in their uh, their show of spirituality, simply to be seen and to be admired of men. There in that text, Jesus spoke about how they would make larger phylacteries and broaden the borders of their garments. These phylacteries were small leather boxes in which they would put scrolls with scripture printed on them. Sometimes this would be worn on the arm. Sometimes it would be worn right around their forehead. And it was meant to be a visualization of their their credence to the Word of God. And, and Jesus says here, he, here some of them would make larger phylacteries. They would make bigger boxes. Could you imagine seeing somebody walk around with a shoebox attached to the forehead? They would broaden the borders of their garments. The borders of the garments were simply something that was prescribed in the Mosaic Law. And they would make the border as big and as visible as possible. And for these scribes and Pharisees that Jesus speaks of, He says to them, the larger their phylactery, the the broader the border of their garments showed how spiritual they were. It would be as if we judge spirituality by the suit that a man wears to church, or how, how sharp he may present himself, or, or how well he may be done up. And he says their whole desire was just to be seen of men. It was done to be seen of them, to be praised of them. And this was an expression of their pride, and that pride constantly fueled the hypocrisy that was in their lives. May I ask of you this morning, who do you do what you do for? Not just why do you do what you do, but who do you do what you do for? Do you do what you do as these Pharisees and scribes to be seen of men? It is the way you present yourselves simply to be a good display to those around you, to be seen and admired of men. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, if I should seek to please men, I should no longer be the servant of Christ. Who do you do what you do for? Listen carefully if your service if your standards, the principles and convictions that you live by, if your spirituality is for the praise and admiration of men, that is a good indicator that you are struggling with hypocrisy that is fueled by pride. That was what was going on with the scribes and the Pharisees. The attitude of hypocrisy is pride. Notice secondly with me this morning the actions of hypocrisy. Go back to John chapter 8. How does hypocrisy demonstrate itself in the life? As I've prayed and I've studied and I've asked the Lord to show me if there is hypocrisy in my own life that needs to be pointed out. And as I have studied over and poured over John chapter 8, the Lord has shown me three actions that these men demonstrated that were demonstrations of hypocrisy. This hypocrisy that was fueled by pride was demonstrated in this text in three different ways. Number one, think about this. Hypocrisy exposes the faults of others and is blind to the faults of self. That's hypocrisy. These men, they came to Jesus. They brought this woman and, and they pointed out the fault that was in her life. Master, here is this woman. She's guilty of adultery. We have caught her in the very act. And as we already know, these men were themselves breaking the law. They were themselves at fault. But they didn't see their own fault. But they were sure ready to point out the fault in her. They seemed to know it well but were oblivious to any failures of their own. Have you ever had a child, maybe one of your own children, come to you and they complain about something that their sibling did to them? I grew up with five siblings. And I know there were many times where I may have gone, no, I never did, I was perfect, but um, 
that was a joke. But there were other times that, that certainly I would have gone to mom and dad, or one of my siblings would, and, and they'd say, Mom, Dad, uh, so-and-so did such and such to me. And what do you often ask as a parent? Well, what did you do to them? Well, I didn't do anything. Just to demonstrate that I know I wasn't a perfect child. When I was younger, my oldest brother, the one who's going to be moving this direction later this month, He's about seven years older than I am, seven and a half. From time to time when I was younger, I, I loved to just to just get at him any way I could. There, there were three or four occasions where I would walk up behind him with a sharpened pencil or a pen. And before he knew what hit him, I would jam that thing right up his nostril. I mean, just as far as I could. And there were times, especially if mom or dad were not immediately present that Gabe would respond. And I could go to mom and dad and say, Gabe, hit me, dad! And of course, dad would do what parents do. Well, what did you do to him? Oh, I didn't do anything. Hypocrisy. You know, that behavior, unfortunately, is dreadfully common among believers, isn't it? We're good. We're quick to find the faults in somebody else while being blind to our own. Secondly, in this text, not only do we see hypocrisy exposes the faults of others and is blind to the faults of self, secondly, we see hypocrisy condemns others and condones self. In verse number 5, again, uh, Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Not only are we going to expose her fault, but we're going to say, what ought to happen to her? Have you ever heard someone make some comment about how God ought to judge so-and-so? You know, we, we're pretty good at being uh, judge, jury, and executioner, aren't we? I don't know about you, but I'm glad God doesn't pass judgment on me the way that I often pass judgment on others. Aren't you? That's the behavior of hypocrisy. They were quick to demand punishment for her failure while excusing their own failure. They had failed in this, as we've said. They were not sinless. They were not innocent, even in this situation. Yet they were ready to say, bring condemnation on her, while completely condoning their own actions. Thirdly, we see it demonstrated this way. Hypocrisy tears others down and builds up self. In fact, many times that's why that type of behavior happens, isn't it? We're ready quickly to tear down other people because it makes us feel better about ourselves. I had that conversation just a few days ago with someone about that. He sharing that type of behavior with me. And we can be guilty of that. Notice how it happens here. It was demonstrated by their treatment of the woman. Again, of course, they bring her. They, they not only cast this accusation, expose her fault. They not only ask for condemnation as Moses' law demanded, but they were ready, weren't they, to tear her down. They did this very publicly. They did this in front of the entire crowd that was there. They were ready to tear down her character, whether she was guilty or not. You know, many times, again, we can have that type of behavior with others. Do you realize it doesn't matter whether someone's guilty or not? We don't have the right before God to go and tear people down in the presence of others. Where is that in the Scripture? You and I do not have the right to go around talking to other people about so-and-so and sharing all their faults and all their failures with, with so-and-so who has no part in the situation, no part in the re, uh, reconciliation of the conflict. Yet we're prone to do that. This hypocrisy was demonstrated by their treatment of Jesus. Here they were ready to accuse Him. They laid a trap for him. They wanted to bring accusation against him again. They're seeking to tear him down. 
Do you realize in Mark chapter number 15, the Bible tells us that the religious leaders brought Jesus to Pilate out of envy. They were jealous of his popularity. They were jealous that the crowds were flocking to him. They were jealous that the crowds were saying, These, he, he teaches not as the scribes and the Pharisees, but as one having authority. They were jealous. And in this situation, not only did they tear her down to build themselves up, they wanted to tear Jesus down to build themselves up. And our nature, apart from God, practices this behavior. I build up myself by tearing others down. I flatter myself by faulting others. I flaunt my supposed superiority while uh, flaunting others' supposed inferiority. And in my human nature, I do those things. In Matthew chapter 23, where we already were, and we won't turn back there for sake of time, but I encourage you to study that entire chapter sometime on your own. Jesus exposed the, the pride of those scribes and Pharisees that fueled their hypocrisy. Then he pronounced eight woes on them, connecting each woe with a specific action or result of their hypocrisy. As you look at those, you'll find that in their hypocrisy, Jesus said they prevented others from entering the kingdom of God. Have you ever heard an unbeliever say, I'll not get saved because of the hypocrites in the church? Now, you know as well as I do, that does not excuse them from salvation. But at the same time, Jesus accused and indicted the religious leaders of his day from preventing others from coming to him because of hypocrisy. And he'd have the same indictment for us. I remember as a young man, a teenager, there was a man that my dad and I would go to visit frequently. I'm, I don't even remember how my dad uh, knew this man or how they had met. But he was an unsaved man, and my dad would often bring up the gospel with him and share Christ with him. And every single time, he would bring up some Christian lawyer he had known who did people wrong. Every time. I remember one time my dad sent me with one of the other men at the church. I was 12 or 13 at the time. Sent me with one of the other men at the church, thinking that, well, maybe I'll send someone else and see if, see if that can just be an encouragement and maybe just show him others that care about him who are willing to share the gospel. And, and sure enough, this other gentleman from our church got into sharing the gospel. I'm sure I was meant to be the silent prayer partner, but this man brought up the same thing. And I finally, as a 12 or 13-year-old, looked at him and said, when are you going to stop excusing yourself because of that? He looked at me and he said, you know, you're kind of irritating me. Well, I figure I probably am. Hypocrisy can do that. Jesus said of the scribes and Pharisees, they stole in the name of good business or stewardship and made long prayers for show. They would even sell their prayer services. They would take donations to say a prayer over you. Jesus said of them, they carried a false gospel that they made false or deceptive oaths. They had an entire system set up where if I make an oath by this, this, or this, then yes, I have to keep an oath. But if I make an oath by this, this, or this, then I can get out of it somehow. They, they obsessed with minor matters while ignoring, ignoring the weighty matters. Jesus said of them, you, you, you follow the, the lesser manner, matters of the law to a T while ignoring the more important matters. Does that ever happen in church? How often does the complaint about something that's going on at church come from someone who's not involved in the most important works of the church, like reaching souls for Jesus Christ or being faithful? awful quiet this morning. They were satisfied with superficial cleansing. The outside looked good, even though the inside is not. They appeared alive and clean on the outside, but Jesus said on the inside they were dead. They were whited sepulchers. Around the times of the feast, this was actually something they would do. They would go and they would whitewash the sepulchers to, to show some type of honor to the dead prophets, to the dead saints. But Jesus said, you're just like those whited sepulchers. You look good on the outside, but inside is death. He 
said you honor the dead prophets, you ignore the living prophets. And the greatest application of that in his day was they they honored Moses and David and Isaiah and so on. And they ignored the bread of life that was right before them. These are actions of hypocrisy. Friend, if we're not careful, if I'm not careful, these are behaviors that each of us can demonstrate. Even within the church. Notice, thirdly this morning, I'm so thankful that the Word of God doesn't present the bad news and leave us looking for the good news. Yes, hypocrisy is something that we can all struggle with, but in the Word of God, we have the answer for hypocrisy. And if it's something that I'm struggling with, if it's something that I that I may be dealing with, or, or maybe it's something that I'm not sure that is a part of my life, that I need God to show me He will do so and help us to deal with it. Let me give you three actions that we can take in relation to the answer for hypocrisy. Number one, we need to make a humble request. We need to come before the Lord humbly. Again, hypocrisy is fueled by pride. It's time that we stop living in our pride and and get rid of the pride. You may have heard it said before, we need to swallow our pride. My dad used to say, don't swallow the pride. If you swallow it, you still have it. Spit it out. Get rid of it. We need to come before the Lord humbly as David did in Psalm 139 and say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Again, hypocrisy is a sin difficult to identify by its nature. It's rooted in a heart of pride that is deceitful and desperately wicked. And to be discovered, we need God to shine the spotlight on it in our lives. And so David says this humbly, God, I want you to examine me, search me. I want you to investigate me. That's know me. I I want you to identify, to see if there's any wicked way in me. And the whole point of that was so that God could show it to him. God, is there any failure in my life at the present? I I want you to... Investigate me. I want you to examine me and identify in my life a humble request. Notice, secondly, the answer for hypocrisy is found in a hopeful reading. Pastor, what do you mean by that? In John chapter 8, as we pointed out, these men experienced a true encounter with the personified Word of God, which was Jesus Himself. As Jesus stood up, again, I don't know what he wrote. It doesn't matter. But as Jesus stood up, he said, He that's without sin among you, he who knew the hearts of all men knew their hearts. He knew they were guilty and he knew how they would respond. They were, they were confronted with the Word of God. This morning, if we will have a true encounter with the written Word of God, the Bible... The Bible will show us our need. And please remember this morning, the Bible is not a window to recognize what someone else needs. It is a mirror to see what I need. Isn't it true that that's often the way we use it? That's hypocrisy. We use the Word of God as a window to see into your life and see what you need. That's not what it is. It's a mirror to show me what I need. A hopeful reading of the Word will identify our need. Thirdly, if we're going to deal with hypocrisy, the answer for hypocrisy is found in a humble request, a hopeful reading, and finally an honest response. If there is anything I can point out positive in John chapter 8 about these men, it's this. The Bible doesn't tell us that they repented but they at least responded honestly. A dishonest response would have led to one or more of the men taking up stones and stoning her. But they didn't. They all went out. They could not and did not deny their own guilt in light of the Word. And we 
too need to respond honestly to our encounters with the word and the conviction that it brings. When God's word speaks to us, be it in a church service, be it in our personal time with the Lord, the right response, the honest response is to come to the Lord, to admit, to confess our failures, to repent. Mark Twain, the author, once said this, We are all like the moon. We have a dark side that we don't want anyone to see. Today I'm asking you to allow God to show you your true self. The likely it is that many of us, if not all of us, have a dark side that we do not even want to see in ourselves. And that's hypocrisy. As we bow our heads and close our eyes this morning, I, I wonder if you would also bow your heart to the Lord. Please understand this truth of the Word of God. You may be experiencing conviction this morning. Conviction is not a wonderful feeling. I know when I experience conviction in my life, and, and I did experience conviction even in the preparation of this message, it is not a wonderful feeling. But understand this today. God does not bring conviction because He desires your judgment. He brings conviction because He desires your repentance. That was true in John chapter 8 of these men. It was true in Matthew 23 when he pronounced the woes on the scribes and Pharisees. It's true of us today. Conviction is not God pointing out that you are facing judgment. Conviction is God saying, I want you to come to repentance, to come back to a place of right fellowship and relationship with me. Let me ask this morning. Is God shining a spotlight in your life? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, in just a moment we're going to have a time of invitation, but let's do some honest self-examination. Let's come before God with that humble request. Search me. Try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. And allow God to speak to our hearts. Heavenly Father, you know the needs of each one that is present. You know the needs in my life, more importantly. And I pray this morning that as we face the reality of the mirror of the Word of God, that you would help us, Lord, to deal with ourselves honestly as you speak to our hearts. Lord, if there is something that we need to deal with today, I pray you'd help us to respond to you. Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, would you stand to your feet? The pianist is playing. If God is dealing with your heart this morning, I'm going to ask you to come. To kneel at this old-fashioned altar and have an honest response between you and the Lord.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again so much for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. Thank you for the truth of the Word of God. And I pray today that you would help us to to continue, Lord, to examine ourselves and to be involved in getting into the Word to see, Lord, what it may be that you're dealing with us about. And may we respond to you as you would have us to. Thank you so much for this church, and I pray your blessing would be upon us. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a card here I'd like to read for you real quickly. It says, thank you. It says, thanking God for you and your thoughtfulness. Cornerstone family, thank you so much for your prayers and support for my missions trip to Antigua. I learned so much about missions and my personal relationship with Christ in such a short period of time. And that, of course, is from Caitlin Peacock. Caitlin's going to be giving us a report, a testimony of her mission trip during the evening service tonight. So I encourage you to come back. I know many of you kept up through Facebook or the blog or some such thing in relation to her trip. But she's going to be getting our whole church report tonight. I encourage you to be back for that. Those of you who will be joining us, you would have received an invitation for the Experience Cornerstone Luncheon. That will be immediately following the service in our fellowship hall uh, at the end of the hall here. I want to encourage you to head that way. Uh, briefly after the service is over for that. Brother Ronnie is going to come with a few more announcements and then we'll be dismissed.